is not your trial date, so please keep in mind that everything that you say on the record today is being recorded and can be used against you at a later time. If you are represented by counsel, either from the public defender's office or private counsel, you may want to speak with your attorneys before speaking on the record. Um, in the courtroom, I do have uh, with me an attorney from the public defender's office, Mr. Brian Reedy. Over at the main jail, we have the attorney, uh, Hector Romero. And if you have private counsel, they come to the courtroom and are able to speak on your behalf. Also in the courtroom, I have an attorney from the state attorney's office, Mr. Eric Linder, as well as we have representatives from pretrial supervision and confinement status. They are here to help to facilitate providing information during the uh, proceedings this morning. I also have the clerk of court who maintains the records. So please note that um, uh, if you need to talk about your case, you can certainly talk, but um, make sure that you check with your attorney before saying anything. If you um, are represented by private counsel and the attorney's not here, you can let me know and we will see how we can facilitate that process. But please don't tell us that you have private counsel, have us make a phone call only to be told that you are not being represented by that attorney. Just because an attorney represented you a year ago or two months ago uh, does not necessarily mean that they're representing you on this current arrest. So unless you or your family have retained counsel for this arrest, um, they may not be representing you. Okay, um, we will uh, begin this morning. Um, the jail has asked me to uh, call uh, some cases out of turn. And so at this time, I will call Scott Peterson. Good morning, Your Honor. Joseph Drew on behalf of Mr. Peterson, together with Daniel Later from my office. Good morning, David Sobel on behalf of Scott Peterson. Good morning. And Your Honor, I, I do have a written um, motion to respond and to modify the conditions of pretrial release of this court be willing to entertain it at this time. Um, no, I'm not going to entertain it, any motions this morning. This is first appearance court. I am going to make uh, the probable cause finding. Um, there, are, there are 11 counts. Um, a circuit court judge has reviewed the affidavit to arrest and have uh, made a determination as well as imposed uh, certain bonds and bond release conditions. And this morning I am uh, going to um, stand by those conditions that are, that are in the report. And I understand, Judge, just for purposes of the record, uh, we would like to uh, challenge the probable cause determination. Okay. Um, because we do not believe that my client in respects to um, the um, statutory violation under, under 827.03, uh, that he meets the statutory definition of, of caregiver, um, that is especially so given the um, the exclusion under section 39.01 subsection 54 expressly carves out um, law enforcement officers acting their uh, capacity as a law enforcement officer. So as a result, we don't believe that there is uh, probable cause in respect to those felony counts. And Your Honor, if I could Briefly, Eric Linder on behalf of the state. If I could briefly provide a response just in case uh, a writ should sure. be filed. Your Honor, under Florida Rule of uh, Criminal Procedure 3.133A1, and that has to deal with uh, non-adversarial probable cause determinations, the rule clearly states that such a hearing or determination is not necessary when an arrest warrant, uh, when that determination has been previously made by a judge and an arrest, issue, arrest warrant issued for the specific offense for which the defendant is charged, as is the case in this matter. Okay, so uh, based on the uh, the affidavit to arrest that was signed by Judge Siegel and also the uh, bonds that the, the court does find probable cause and also the bonds that were imposed along with special conditions, those special conditions will remain in place and a total bond of $102,000. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Judge, if, if one final thing, sure. the, 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 one of the special conditions of bond is that my client uh, turn in his passport. Uh, my client resides in North Carolina, and as a result, his passport is in North Carolina. Um, we would ask that the court uh, modify that condition to allow um, 72 hours, so effectively, my client go back home, 
FedEx me his passport and I can personally surrender it to the clerk of court. Is there no one that could send the client's passport in from North Carolina as opposed to him going to get it and to send it in? Um, Normally under normal conditions, we did the, the passport has to be surrendered prior to release. I understand, Judge, but you know, in, in to, well, to answer your first, first question, I believe there is a person that might be able to. Yes. Um, but given that um, my client, um, that this person would have to travel from Florida back up to North Carolina, and in order to do this, you know, I'm anticipating that this is going to take at least a couple days, and that my client would unnecessarily be um, remain in custody until that takes place. So I just asked ask for a couple days for, for this to, to, to occur. Under the state would request that the court take no action modif modifying this condition. Your Honor has already uh, ordered that the collateral uh, requirement remain in place, which means he's going to have to go in front of his assigned judge to sign off and find that the collateral condition has been satisfied before he could be released. Uh, this matter should be uh, taken up by uh, his assigned judge to determine if uh, the inconvenience that counsel is determining outweighs the need to ensure that his passport is surrendered prior to his release. Right, I'm going to deny that request at this time as well. Okay. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jolanda Bowles. Anybody in there? Yeah. <laughs> 